We've been speaking about change for the last few weeks, and we've got three more. We've got this one and three more to go. And so there's kind of six ways that I can talk to you guys about how to change, how to have the power to change the things in your life that you wish that you could change, but have always felt maybe powerless to be able to change. And the reason that there are six of these is because it takes more than one time for it to, to sink in. It, it's when we tell uh, Benjamin, our, our three-year-old, almost four-year-old, to do something, it, he doesn't respond to the first no. You know, it's, Benjamin, don't do that. And it's like it just whizzes over his head, and then you say no again. And, I mean, he's like, I don't know if you guys have seen The Matrix. Anyone seen the movie Matrix? Neo dodging bullets. You know, he's dodging no's like, you know, crazy. So it takes about 10 to, to get him to finally stop. And so we're doing six of these because I know that for some of you, it, it hit on week one, and some of you, it's going to hit on week six. Because I believe that it's worth it. Because there, there's a lot of things that, that we feel powerless to change about ourselves. And that's a lie. That's not from God. And so today we're focusing on habits. And, and especially on holy habits. But there's, there's two components that I want to focus around as, as compared or as kind of involved in how we make decisions. And what it is that we would like to change about ourselves. And what it is that we find you know, hard to change about ourselves. And that's hope and habits. So these are the two elements that we're going to focus on today. So hope, talk about that. Hope is good. We, we need hope. It's good to have hope. Hope is something that fuels us. It's something that, um, that, that causes us to carry on, to move on. I, I remember there was a story. Um, no, there's lots of stories about this. Uh, there's a guy that wrote a book, Victor Frankel, who wrote a book, Man's Search for Meaning. And he talks about it talks about hope and how when, when you lose hope in your situation, that, that, that's kind of when you start to let go of life. And especially he was in a, um, he was, I think he was at Auschwitz, but he was in a, a concentration camp. And so hope, hope is something that we value here. I, we're going to actually, I'm about to tell you that hope isn't what you need. So before I tell you that hope isn't what you need, I do want you to know that, that it's, it's, it's inherently good for you and it's inherently something that you need. So I'm, I'm not speaking against hope. But you know, ho hope is, is not necessarily going to lead you to the change that I'm talking about today. Instead, it's habits. Habits are what's going to lead you to the change. See, see, habits are, are these things that we do. You know, who, who, anyone here have bad habits? On everyone's hand should go up there. We all, have, we all have bad habits, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the little things that we do, uh, our little ticks and quirks about ourselves. You know, we think it's what makes us unique and, and individual. And your spouse or your, your partner thinks it's what makes you annoying. But your habits are just how you do things. The way that you wake up in the morning what is your morning routine? What are your morning habits? You know, we, I wake up in the morning, I make coffee, and then I take my son Leafa to school uh, at, at six. He goes to work out, and then I come home, and it's the same thing pretty much every single morning. It's the same thing. We have uh, habits at night that we do. We, we have habits that get the kids in bed, but your habits, it's not just I have a habit of smoking cigarettes. So we say, okay, that's a bad habit. You know, that's what people say. It, it's, it's not just that. Your habit is how you do the things that you do. It's how you drive to work. You drive to work the same way every day. Right now, uh, we moved back into Pinelands, and I don't come to work the same way every day because I'm searching for that magic spot where I can get out of Pinelands and to this church without traffic. And so I try a different spot every morning. But you guys, generally, you take the, different, or you take the same way to work. And, and what ends up happening throughout you know, your day, from the time that you wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed, is a lot of your day is on autopilot because of the habits that you have in place. And in fact, there was a study done that says 40% of what we do is based on habits. 40% of what you do from the time you wake up in the morning to the time that you go to bed at night is you on autopilot. It's, it's you just being, it, it's just you operating. You know, I don't know if you've ever just ended up at work and kind of zoned back in and thought, I don't remember driving here. You know, because it's such a habit. You're not even thinking about it. You know, 40%, that's a lot. 40% of what we do is just so deeply ingrained in us that we just do it without even thinking about it. So I, I want to now, so here's where I'm going to show you the difference between 
hope and habits, and, and this is where it's going to make sense to you, because habits are so deeply ingrained to us, and so I need you to understand that your habits are really, really important, and those are the things that really, really matter, and that, that's something that I'm going to give you today that I do believe will lead you to change, but let's look at hope. So here, here's what hope is. Hope represents your goals and your desires. So I hope that I get into this university. I hope that she says yes when I ask her to marry me. I hope that my car doesn't run out of gas on the way to work. You know, I hope that dinner is ready. You know, um, some, sometimes it's, it's our hope can be in, in little like menial things, like things don't matter all that much. And then it can be in these huge things like, you know, I hope that my, my mother or my sister, my brother, my father, whoever's in the hospital pulls through this surgery. You know, the, the other week when Benjamin was sick and he was having stomach cramps and he didn't understand what stomach cramps were, it was like, man, God, I hope that you take those away from him as soon as possible. And, and hope is, is these desires, but it's also the, these goals that you have. It's what is it that you're hoping for in your future? What do you hope, or are you even hoping for anything in your future? What is it that you're hoping for this week or hoping for tomorrow? Are you hoping that your business gets a contract or you get more work? Are you hoping that, that you come home and that, that your spouse forgives you? Are you, are you? What is it that your hope is for tomorrow or the next day or the next week or the next year? See, ho hope represents goals. You know, the Bible says that we also, we put our hope in Christ because we haven't earned Christ. We get Christ through grace. Jesus loves us. He saved us through grace. So therefore, my hope is in Christ because I can say, okay, Jesus, my goal is to be in communion with you. My goal is to be in heaven with you and God when I pass away. That's my desire. That's what I want. I'm putting my hope, my goals, and my desires in you because I know that through grace, I'm saved. See, it's Hope we can represent as goals and desires. Now, habits are a little bit different. Habits are the systems that you have in place. So this is how you do the things that you do. So it's, if you look at your life as a breakdown of systems, you put your toothbrush in a place because it works there. You, you have your house organized in a way that fits a certain system. You have your car organized in a way that fits a certain system. Yeah, uh, when we just got a, a van for Casey and the kids and we had to create a system on how she could plug an auxiliary cable into an iPhone and also charge it at the same time. And that was a system. It was a system that had to be put in place. And now, Casey has a habit on how to get the music playing in the van uh, when, when the kids are in there. And right now, it's playing one song. I'm in the Lord's Army. And that's Benjamin. That's the only song he wants to listen to in there. And I feel so sorry for Casey because she drives around with, with him a lot. But your, your habits are your systems. So you have a system for dealing with anxiety. Maybe you bite your nails, maybe you smoke, maybe you drink, uh, maybe you tap your foot on the ground, maybe your legs get jittery. You, you have a system for how you deal with that. You have a system for how you deal with hurt. You withdraw or you confront. You have a system with how you deal with, with other relationships and how you make friends. See, you have systems for how you do everything in life, everything from getting ready in the morning to how you interact with each other and how you deal with the things that, that life is throwing at you. So, hope is great, but hope alone is not going to lead you to the change that you want to see in your life or that you're wanting to make in your life. It's your habits and your systems. And so, if you want what you're hoping for, then you have to change your habits. There's no other way around it. You can't hope to lose weight and, and, and continue to eat ice cream and candy bars. Somebody came up to me last week and said, hey, lay off the ice cream a little bit. Because <laughs> you know, I've, I've used it the last three weeks as an example. That's because I relate to it. But you, you can't hope for something and not change something. You can't hope to get your learners and not change the habit of not studying. You have to create a system, a habit of studying so that you can pass that test. Hope is, is a goal and a desire. Habit is a system for getting there. There's no way that you can avoid it. You have to deal with changing your habits. 
Now, as you saw at the beginning of this, the title of this is Holy Habits. And when I was preparing this message, I thought to myself, why does it have to be a holy habit? Or what about the person that's out there that, that, that doesn't want a holy habit? Maybe you just want a good habit. Or what about the person that, that doesn't know Jesus? Or what about the person that's been hurt by Jesus? You know, I, I try and consider you guys in this. I'm not just speaking to, to those that have been saved and given their life and studied their Bible for 20 years. And I thought, I don't want to be entitled and just, just think, oh, well, well we're going to call it holy habits and you need to develop a holy habit. So I feel like my role is not to convince you to have a holy habit. So if you're not all about the holy part of the habit, that's okay. You can just sit and you can listen because you can still learn something valuable and important out of this. But I do think that, that habits are good, but I do think that a holy habit is something that's really special. And the reason that I think that is because I know the power behind a holy habit. See, I know the power behind good habits. And say it takes 21 days to, to break a bad habit and start a good habit. I know the power of that. But I also know the power of having a holy habit. See, adding that word holy on there. So if you're open to that, that's what we're going to talk about. If you're not open to that, that's also okay. You know, let it sink in. And let God, I'm going to trust that God will reveal it to you. It's not my job. That's between you and God. So... Why a holy habit? Well, what is a holy habit? So what would we consider a holy habit? So when I thought about this, I thought, well, how, how do I put this in a way that, that, you know, that makes sense? Instead of giving you examples of, well, this qualifies as holy, this doesn't qualify as holy, um, you have to do this, but you can't do that. I thought, okay, see, a, a holy habit is this. It's any habit that brings you closer to God or it's any habit that gives God more access to you. That, that's, a, that's a holy habit. So you can take any habit that you want to form, any system that you want to make, and if you add the word holy to it, you're basically saying, in this system or in this habit or in this routine of how I deal with anxiety or depression or an addiction or even how I deal with loving my wife, I want to create a better habit, a better system of taking my wife out on dates. Well, that's a habit. But if I want to add the word holy to it, then I add in this component, well, because God made me to be a good husband. So I'm going to then add prayer into that habit and say, Lord, I want to be a better husband. I want to be a more tender husband, more available to my wife. And so I want to draw near to you and give you access to more of me. And now that regular habit has now become a holy habit. So you don't have to have the holy part. It's not a prerequisite for a habit being good, but it is a good thing. And if you try it just one time on one habit, I promise that you'll see that there's an enormous amount of power that comes with that. And so I want to show you that. I want to show you how that plays out. It's not just good advice coming from me or coming from other people. This is actually in the Bible. And so we're going to look at a guy named Daniel. Now, you guys know about Daniel. You know about the lion's den, or, or many of you do. But if you don't, let me give you a little history about Daniel. But Daniel, he, he has the power of one holy habit in, in this event that we're going to talk about this morning. He does. So this is an example of having one holy habit. So a little history on Daniel. Daniel was Jewish, and Daniel's living in the city of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, that's God's chosen people. So these are the people that came all the way out of Egypt, and they wandered around for 40 years because they weren't you know, behaving, and so God had to sort them out. And they ended up in uh, establishing in the Promised Land, and they established the city Jerusalem. And they're, they're living there, and I, I think it's about um, 605 B.C., or it's either 506. Don't quote me on that. It's one of those two. But Jerusalem was handed over to the Babylonians. So the Babylonians came in, and because Jerusalem wasn't behaving with God, God said, okay, I'm going to let you kind of get sorted out. And he handed over the city to the Babylonians. And that was under a, a king named Nebuchadnezzar. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes in, and this is a pretty ruthless guy. And so when he would take a, a, a city, he would then put out kind of a decree to his soldiers or to his, his, his trusted men. And he would say, I want you to go around and I want you to collect some of the smartest and the brightest. 
So the Babylonians would come in, they would set a portion aside, okay, we're going to kill them. They would set some women aside, okay, we're going to keep them for us. And then they would look around and they would say, okay, who's, 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 who's really smart here? Who's really good here? This is quite clever. And so here's what, here's what happens exactly in this situation. Uh, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 1 here, verses 3 and 4. So, and the Babylonian king told Ashpenaz, which is probably, you know, the, the chief of his officials, he says, bring in some of the sons of Israel. So Israel is the, is the Jewish people. So he's saying, go out there and get some of the sons of Israel. And in fact, I want you to include some from the royal family and some from the nobles. So King Nebuchadnezzar, he had an agenda here. It wasn't just anyone he was after. He was after somebody that, that had a certain characteristic and a certain quality uh, to them. Now, before I read the characteristics to you, now I, I really identified with what Nebuchadnezzar was looking for. So all the qualities that, that I inhabit, I've highlighted in, in yellow. So we'll put these up here. So he goes on here, and in verse 4, young men without blemish and handsome in appearance, right? <laughs> Skillful in all wisdom, you guys hired me. <laughs> Endowed with intelligence and discernment. Still alive. Doing good there. And quick to understand. I mean, I thought, man, he's talking about me here. I would definitely be captured. So ask yourself, would I be captured by the Babylonians or would I be cast aside? So anyway, then he goes on to say, they're also competent to stand in the presence of the king and able to serve in the king's palace. See, the, the Babylonians understood that if you could change the habits of somebody, then you could change the person. So, so they intentionally went out and they found people. And then what they would end up doing is they would end up kind of influencing them. But they knew this truth right here. If you change the habit, you change the person. It's not if you change the hope, then you change the person. Now, you can encourage someone with hope or you can kind of take hope away from them. But, but that wasn't the point. See, Nebuchadnezzar would rather just, to just kill you and take you out than try and deal with whether or not you feel hopeful or not. He said he was interested in assimilating you into his culture. Now, other people that do that would be, you know, sports teams, sports fans. You know, I know that some of you guys are fanatic, you know, soccer fans. So it's, you know, Chelsea for life, Liverpool for life, you know, uh, Manchester City. And, and if you choose one of those teams... You have to be fully assimilated into the culture of that team. Same with in the States. We've got, you know, the military. We've got uh, a group called the Marines. And they have this kind of, and the Navy SEALs. And they have this, this thing that they made a TV show even out of, of the process of becoming a Navy SEAL. And they break you down to nothing. And they build you back up. Because what they're doing is they're changing. If they, they know if they change your habit, how you deal with pain, how you deal with adversity, how you deal with... Um, tough situations. If they change that, then they change you as a person. Now, the Babylonians were really clever. And, th and this, is, this is what they focus on. They believe that if they changed your thinking, that they could do that through re-education. So they would change thinking through re-education. They educated them in their arts and in their texts and in their literature. They changed their names, which they felt like changed their loyalty. When Daniel and his friends were captured, they were all given different names because they wanted to change their loyalty from a Jewish loyalty now to a Babylonian loyalty. So they literally renamed you. The old self is gone. The new self is here. You're now Babylonian. And then lifestyle. They changed their lifestyle by changing their diets. Now, it's not that they, they, they put them on a low-carb diet or on, a high or on a high fiber, high fat diet. What they were doing there is, see, the Jewish culture was, was very specific about their diet. Animals that were clean, animals that were unclean. And so by changing their diets, by changing their lifestyle, they were stripping them from their heritage, from their culture, from their laws. And so the Babylonians knew if we take care of these things here then we've got them. We fully have assimilated them into our culture. So as we go back to Daniel's story, Daniel and some of his friends are captured. And, and as this assimilation process starts to happen, Daniel and his friends, they refuse 
to agree to it. They refuse to do it. And so that's where we get things like the Daniel diet. I don't know if anyone tried the Daniel fast or the Daniel diet. Yeah, we've got a few people that did that. That basically was Daniel telling um, the Babylonians, I'm not going to eat the, the food that you're giving me. Because that food was first given as a sacrifice to their God. And then the first portion after that was given to, to Daniel and the people that they had, had taken captive. Daniel said, no, 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 I'm not going to eat that. Give me a bunch of twigs and berries and tree bark. And that's the, the, the Daniel diet, the Daniel fast. Or that's at least how you're going to feel a week into it. So it's a 21-day thing. And so they, they, that's where that comes from. The other thing that comes from this is the story about uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where they get thrown into a fiery furnace. The reason they get thrown into a furnace is because they refuse to bow to the king. And so because they refuse, they get thrown into you know, a little like a pit of fire. And in the pit of fire, they're not touched. And they see three of them thrown in, but four people walking around. There's an angel with them. So that, that, that comes from them refusing to be assimilated. Now, Daniel, he continues this process of saying no. He, he stands up for his culture and for who he is. But because of that, God continues to, to bless Daniel. And he has this ability to interpret dreams. And if you look at, at Daniel chapters 1 through chapter 6, you will see Daniel just interpreting dreams for kings, king after king after king. And when he interprets these dreams for them, they're all thankful and they all praise God for it. And so Daniel is serving under a king named Darius. And, and him and Darius actually have a pretty good relationship. Daniel had interpreted his dream. And by interpreting dreams, it would like set the king up well to take care of his people. So as a king, you had to make sure that your people had food. You had to make sure you had grain in the storehouse. And so these dreams would say, hey, there's going to be famine coming. There's going to be seasons of good coming. They would kind of tell the, the king's future. So this is a big deal. And Daniel seemed to be the only one that could give an accurate kind of translation of what these dreams meant. And so Darius and Daniel, they're like, they're like buddies, okay? They're close. Darius, Darius likes Daniel. And in fact, he put Daniel and two other people in charge of everything going on. And Daniel is excelling. He's doing really, really well. And the other two people, they have bad habits and bad systems for how to deal with jealousy and so what they do is they create a conspiracy about Daniel. And so what they do is they try and find dirt on Daniel. And if they can find this dirt, they're going to uncover it and get him in trouble with King Darius. So they, they, they do this. Let's look at what they do here. So it says, then the other two commissioners, so there's Daniel and, and two others, and satraps, which would be like people, kind of like governors or, or local people in power, they began trying to find a reason to bring a complaint against Daniel concerning the administration of the kingdom. So they want to take a complaint. They want to tell the king, hey, look at what Daniel's doing, you know. They want to be a Karen. So, but they could find no reason for an accusation or evidence of corruption. Nothing in Daniel's life gave them any dirt. Daniel was squeaky clean. Nothing in the past. Daniel lived a squeaky king life. So what they did is they did this. Because they couldn't find evidence or corruption, and because he was faithful, he was a man of high moral character and personal integrity, and no negligence or corruption of any kind was found in him. So what are they going to do? Well, they know that Daniel is a guy that won't compromise his faith and his, his relationship with Jesus. So they say, okay, the only way that we're going to get Daniel is if we can incorporate his faith and his relationship with Jesus into this scheme. So, so here's what they do in the, in the next verse here. These men said, we will not find any basis for an accusation against this Daniel unless we find something against him in connection with the law of his God. So they do that. They come up with this plan. They go to King Darius and they say, Darius, you're like a great guy. And Darius is like, yeah, I'm king. And they're like, you know, you're like really, really great. And in fact, you're so great, we should just take a period of time and decree that everybody bows down and just praises you. And Darius is like, that actually sounds like a pretty good idea. I like that at face value. And so they say, okay, let's decree it. And the king decrees it. And so after the decree has been signed, Daniel, he does his one holy habit. He goes to his house, and he goes up his stairs to his upper room, and he gets on his knees, looks out a window facing Jerusalem, 
and he prays. And as Daniel is doing that holy habit, see, I, I believe it's a habit because Daniel has spent his entire life in captivity and he's always been blessed. Daniel's interpreted dreams for kings and he's always been right and favored. You know, that doesn't come, that's not a shot in the dark. Daniel had a habit of talking with God, of hearing God. It was a holy habit because it drew him closer to God and it gave God more access to him. So Daniel goes up to do his holy habit. And when he does, those two guys that conspired against him, they run to the king and they say, Daniel prayed to his God and not to you. And the king is actually upset about this because he realizes, oh no, that means that Daniel has to be put to death. But I like, I like Daniel. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, but king, if you go against your decree, then people are going to see you as weak. They're going to see you as someone that can be overtaken. And so Darius, he says, man, unfortunately, I've got to do this. And so King Darius, they, they bring Daniel in, and they take him to the, lion, the, the den of lions. And I think it's amazing that they had a den of they had lions captured in a den. And they had this practice where, where, they were going to, where they were going to put Daniel, like they would do other people, into this, this pit. And so the king in Daniel 6.16 and this is a somber moment for Darius. He's not happy about this at all. He's, he's upset. He's upset that he has to do this because he loves Daniel. Then the king gave a command, and Daniel was brought and thrown into the den of lions. Now look what Darius says. Darius says this with a tender heart. And I'll explain to you why it was a tender heart. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you constantly serve, so constantly serve, what is that? A habit. Rescue you himself. So Darius is pleading, Daniel, may your God, who you have a, have, who you have a habit of, of serving, I'm praying, my hope. See, Darius had hope that Daniel would be rescued by his God. But Daniel had the habit of going to God and making it a holy habit and knew that he would then be rescued. That's the difference between a hope and a habit. It wasn't Darius's hope that allowed Daniel to survive the lion's den. It was Daniel's holy habit of communicating with God. And so Daniel is in the lion's den, and God shuts all the mouths of the lions. And Daniel goes all night long and doesn't get touched by a single lion. And in the morning, or actually we, we learn even before morning, as soon as Daniel is thrown in, King Darius goes and he's fasting and he's praying for Daniel. And in the morning, as soon as the sun comes up, he runs there. This is how I know he had compassion. He runs to, to, to Daniel, to the lion's den, and there's a big stone over it that's, that's enclosing them in, and he shouts to Daniel, 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 are you okay? Are you okay? See, Darius didn't know because he had hope, but his hope didn't guarantee that Daniel would be alive or dead. He just had hope for it. But Daniel, because of his one holy habit, he shouted back at Darius and said, yeah, I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. And so because of Daniel's small holy habit of prayer, it had an impact on him, on Daniel. It had an impact on a king. And then it had an impact on the entire nation. Because see, after this, what ended up happening is King Darius ended up decreeing to all of the nation that they were to worship God and that they were to worship Daniel's God. See, that, that's why I say the power of a holy habit. Because I... I don't think a normal habit would get you out of the lion's den, but I believe a holy habit will get you out of the lion's den. Hope won't get you out, but a habit will. That's the difference between Darius and, and Daniel. And so for the rest of this message, what I want to do is I want to teach you how to develop a habit. And I want to hope that you develop this habit as a holy habit, but I, I'm going to teach you how to do this. So you're going to walk out and you're going to know this is exactly how I do this. So we've got to look at, first of all, we've been doing these, these building blocks. Each one of these sermons is built on, on the, the, the one that comes before it. So if we look at our building blocks, the first building block that we had was the first Sunday, and it was change comes through spiritual transformation, not behavioral modification. So it was all about 
about bringing something spiritual into why you wanted to change. So we asked ourselves the question, what is your spiritual why? Why do you want to change? But, but what's, if it's not spiritual, if it doesn't have something to do with, 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 uh, with God or, or with the Spirit of God, then it's, it's just behavior. So what was your spiritual why? Then the second week, we, we talked about identity. And, and I talked about how you do the things you do because of the way that you think about you. And, and I challenge you, okay, to, to think about your spiritual who. Who does God say that you are? Not who you say that you are, but who does God say that you are? We're going to stop listening to the negative voices. And now this week, the third one is that we're going to be talking about your spiritual what. So based on who you want to become, what is one small habit that you need to start? Now, don't overcomplicate this. And don't over-spiritualize this either. This is simple. God's not tricky. God's, God's not going to go uh, home, or you're not going to go home, and on Friday, God's not going to say, man, I was going to give you an amazing week, but because you're not smart enough or creative enough, you didn't figure out how to develop that one habit, and, and so, sorry, you just had a bad week because of that. Like, God's not mean. He's not vindictive. He's not tricky. Instead, God's for you, and he's very clear, and he will be clear when he talks to you. And so I want you to think about your spiritual what. What is the one small habit today that you need to start? Now, before you start the habit, I'm going to give you two different kind of chunks of information uh, that I want you to understand. This is, it gets a little bit like behavioral kind of psychology here, but the first one is the habit cycle. So there's a cycle to how your habits work. All, all of us have these, and there's four parts to it. So there's the cue, the craving, the response, and the reward. So something cues you to, to want to, to, to desire a reward, and then your craving is, is you responding to that desire and you wanting to, to, to go after that reward. Your response is you actually obtaining a reward, and then the, the reward is, is euphoria. So if I could put it to you this way, um, you know, me with, with, I've talked about this a million times, I love petrol stations, I love getting a cool drink, I love the chips, the candy bar, whatever, and so a cue for me was driving by a petrol station. It's like as soon as I drove by it, I would all of a sudden have a craving. I'd be like, man, I need a bar of one, and if I don't get it, my life is horrible. And my response would be, I'm going to go and I'm going to obtain that bar of one, and that bar of one is going to give me the reward, which is going to be my, uh, my euphoria. It's like, I got it. I gave myself that. So everyone has a cues, and everyone has, has this process that you go through. But it starts with a cue. So if, if you're going to change you, then you have to also change your cue. You, you've got to learn how to change that. You've got to learn how to, how to adapt and how to take what's cueing you to want one thing and change that, that cue. Now, I, I, I don't know how you do that in your life, but it could be something as simple as like, for me, I would just drive home a different way so I didn't pass a petrol station. You know, what, what are the things, what are your triggers? And then how do you change that cue? Because if you can change that, then that gives you access to change you. That, that's so important. As you think about the habit that you want to put in place, you can't put it in place if you don't have a system behind it. And your, your, your system and your habits have to start. If you need a starting place, all of us, we, we, we try and think about, well, how do I stop getting the reward? But we don't consider these things. Start with your, your cue. Start with what's triggering you first. And so then, then you can work through this process here. The, the last piece of information I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you three easy ways to start your habit. These are three things that are not complicated, and these are, the way, these are ways that you can start a habit. This is a super practical message today, because I want you to go home, and I want you to be free to be changed. So there's three elements to an effective habit. The first one is you're going to start small. So your first habit, let's say you want to get into shape. Your first habit is not, I'm going to go run a marathon. Your first habit may be, I'm going to get up in the morning and put my shoes on and go for a walk. Start small. We, we tend to start really, really big, but I want you to start small. So take the thing that you want to change about yourself, and instead of 
uh, instead of thinking, well, I just want this huge thing in me changed, start small. Now, I'll give you another example of, uh, of myself. Um, I've been trying to lose weight. And as I was trying to you know, lose weight, I didn't say, okay, I'm going to just hopefully in the next two weeks, I'm going to stop eating. I'm not going to eat for three weeks and I'm going to lose all the weight that I want to lose. No, it was, hey, can I lose one kilogram a week? And I've been able to do that. It's starting small. See, start small. Give yourself some credit. Make it winnable. The, the second thing is I want you to make it obvious. So, you, like, for example, if you want to start reading your Bible, then guess what? Put your Bible uh, on top of the TV remote. Or put your Bible on the sink where you brush your teeth. Or put your Bible uh, next to the cereal box where you have breakfast. But make it obvious. H- help your habit to become obvious. It's like if I want to go to the gym, I pack my bag the night before. It's, I'm making it obvious. Hey, I'm not going to avoid this today. So you start small and you make it obvious. And the last one that you're going to do is you're going to make it easy. Because you want to set yourself up for success. So you start small. You make it obvious, and you make it easy. You work on the things that are cueing the behavior that you want to change. And you put systems in place. You put habits in place that then help you to have that change. And you add a holy component to it. And when you do that, you start doing this thing called habit stacking, which which says this, I will do blank after I do blank. See, Daniel prayed three times a day. And my guess is, I will pray after I eat. I will do blank after I do blank. See, it's, you're stacking behavior on top of behavior. So my, my, my prayer for you is that you start to realize that like, you really have no idea what God can do through one small holy habit in your life. You have no idea what God can do through that. I'll end with this story here, and then I'll pray, and we're going to dismiss. But I heard a story. A pastor was talking about a guy in his church, and and this guy was really struggling with with how to start a holy habit, how to have a quiet time, how to spend time with God. It was too complicated. And what he ended up doing is he made it easy, started small, and he made he made it obvious. So every morning he got up and he would sit in a rocking chair and he would just stare outside. That was it. And for months and months and months, he got up in the morning and he sat in a rocking chair and he just watched the sun come up outside. No prayer, no nothing special, just that was it. And then eventually that turned into, he then put the Bible in the chair. So in the mornings he got up, he went and he had to pick the Bible up out of the chair in order order to put his bum in the chair. And what ended up happening over time, over a long period of time, this guy started having time with God where he started praying he said one prayer one day turned into another prayer the next day, turned into a little bit of Bible time, turned into a little bit of prayer time. And 30 years later, this guy still had the same chair. And every time he looked at that chair, he saw the prayers for his children and he saw the fruit from it. He saw prayers for his family and he saw fruit from it. He saw prayers for himself and he saw fruit from it. It's one small holy habit. You have no idea how much power is in that, but there's an incredible amount of power in it. So my hope for you today, it's hope, is that you will go home today and that God will put a habit in your mind, a system, a holy habit, and that you get excited about the potential that this one easy holy habit can have in your life. So I'm going to close this out in prayer here. Heavenly Father, Uh, Thank you, Lord, for our baptisms today. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us. And Father, I just pray as we depart that that you just plant seeds in people's minds, that you put uh, a very practical message in their hearts, that that they walk away with a practical way to create a habit and a practical way to create a holy habit. So Father, I pray that everyone in here is burdened, convicted, drawn near to you, to just open up more of themselves to you and to seek you even more. Heavenly Father, you're amazing. And we see what happens when we have holy habits, we have baptisms, we have salvations. And we praise you for that. Thank you, Father, for using us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
So I'm going to go ahead and, and let you guys go. Before I let you go, I want you to know that we have a Good Friday service coming up on Good Friday. So this week is kids stuff on Friday. Then we've got Good Friday here at 9 a.m. And then we have Easter Sunday. We have a service here at 9 a.m. Both of them are family services. We would love for you to come. Last year, we were overwhelmed with how many people came. So we're going to be prepared. We'll have extra seats. We'll have everything ready for you guys. Uh, but we would love to have you. Remember, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, 9 a.m. here at South Point. Hope you guys have an amazing day today. We're a friendly church. We've got tea and coffee outside.